Good evening, everyone. I'm Alfredo Medina. I'm the Executive Director of the Office for Public Engagement. And hi, everyone. My name is Damlola Aristania. I serve as the President of the Student Association, as well as the Secretary of the SUNY Student Assembly. We are so excited to be your host for the very first edition of Leading Questions. You open this new online conversation series about the ups, downs, and ins and outs of leadership. So we hope tonight you'll gain valuable insights about what it means to take on a leadership role, whether that's in your future career, as a citizen, or right here and now as a student at UAlbany. But before we get started, I want to ask you to please send your questions for the Attorney General through the Q&A function. You can send them anytime. Uh, we'll be sharing them with the AG in a little bit, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Also, the chat function will not be live during the program. Now, without further ado, let me introduce Mike Christakis, Vice President for Student Affairs. Thank you, Dr. Medina. Good evening, everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our special guest, New York State Attorney General Letitia James. President Rodriguez was extremely disappointed he couldn't be here himself tonight, but he asked that I extend his warmest welcome and gratitude to the Attorney General for finding time in her incredibly busy schedule to help us launch this important new educational initiative on leadership. Thank you also to you Albany alums, Ibrahim Khan, Chief of Staff to the Attorney General, and Patrick Lewis, the Attorney General's scheduler, who have been so gracious and helpful in facilitating the Attorney General's visit tonight. We're, we're very proud of you both. At UAlbany, we develop leaders in all disciplines who go on to do great things in both the public and private sectors. We do that by immersing our students in experiential learning opportunities where they are able to apply what they've learned to real world challenges and by providing them with the chance to interact with dedicated and talented professionals and public servants who become their models and mentors. We're so pleased to be able to continue that tradition through tonight's conversation with the Attorney General. Thank you for being here this evening, Attorney General James. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christakis, and welcome, Attorney General James. We are so grateful to have the Attorney General here this evening to share a bit about her personal journey and experiences with you all me students. This wonderful woman does it all, but just a quick little bio. Letitia Tish James is the 67th Attorney General for the state of New York. She's an experienced attorney and public servant with a long record of accomplishments. She is the first woman of color to hold a statewide office in New York and the first woman to be elected Attorney General. She is a former New York State Assistant Attorney General and public advocate for the city of New York. For a decade, she served on the New York City Council, representing the 35th Council District in Brooklyn. She has been council and a member of the legislative staff within the New York State Assembly. She's also a former public defender, a proud Brooklynite, a graduate of Lehman College, and Howard Student School of Law. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor oh, and a privilege. I'm just as excited uh, as you are, and I couldn't help but seeing Howard University, uh, Alpha Chapter to my fraternity, Phi Beta Sigma, I had to shout that out there if they're in, the, in attendance. Um, <laughs> but we have a number of students in the audience tonight. Um, so we're going to start with a quick poll to get a sense of what disciplines they represent. So if you, you are you Albany student, um, please enter a response to the following questions. And we have a variety of different ones that are on there. Pick the one that aligns best with uh, your major or your program. All right, and the results are coming in and it looks uh, political science or public administration leads with 45%, kind of makes sense, right? Followed uh, right by uh, criminal justice or about 20%. And um, also um, some good representation from emergency preparedness, homeland security and cybersecurity. Uh, so it also looks like, you know, we have a good representation across the, the variety of different um, colleges and schools here at the University of Albany. So. Again, with that, uh, why don't we start with, um, I'm trying to just uh, get to this part here. So why don't we just start with the first series of questions? 
And so the first one um, is when and how did you know what path you wanted to pursue? Um, it started for me um, when I was around 13, 12, 13. Um, my brother was um, falsely arrested and my mother took me to criminal court in Brooklyn. Um, and when we walked into court, she asked the court officer a simple question. Where was her son? Um, the court officer responded by saying, um, sit down and shut up. Um, everyone in the courtroom, I noticed, uh, all the defendants looked like me. All of the people in the gallery looked like me. Um, but um, all of the individuals in, the, in positions of power did not look like me. From the judge to the lawyers, to the correction officers, to the police. Um, it was not representative. And I vowed at that point in time um, that I would never allow any mother or grandmother, or father or grandfather, anyone who asked a simple question, where was their loved one, to be disrespected in that fashion. And so I made a vow that I'd go to law school and come back and render justice and never allow that to happen again which is why I became um, an attorney, um, and which is why um, um, I treat everyone with great respect, no matter who they are, no matter what they look like, um, no matter what their ethnicity is or their gender identity, or their sexual preferences, it really doesn't matter to me. I respect the entire human family. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. What would you say are skills that college students should focus on developing now to really prepare them for public office? And what are good ways to go about developing these skills? Well, you know, we're living in a period of chaos and confusion, a lot of turmoil. Um, and we've got, uh, what is it, 49, 48 more days in order to restore normalcy to this country. And so first of all, individuals need to know current events. They need to know what's happening um, in their environs, environment. They need to know what's happening politically. Um, they need to know how to communicate. They need to know a little bit about government. Um, and individuals um, need to ha um, have a passion, um, a reason for living, um, a reason that gets them up early in the morning. Um, a reason um, that drives them. And what drives me again is my sense of justice, but also um, what drives me now is recognizing and understanding um, that the founders of this country created um, three levels of government, three, three arms of government, three branches of government. Um, and each of them has a role. And at this point in time in our history, the executive on the federal level, unfortunately, is not functioning. The legislature, unfortunately, doesn't have backbone or a spine. And the only arm of government right now, which is a stabilizing force, is the judiciary. And um, it's an honor and a privilege as the Attorney General of the state of New York uh, to render justice, but to ensure um, that, our, that our Constitution is a living and breathing document and that it applies to all individuals. Um, and that we, um, as New Yorkers and as a society, uh, must continue to stand up and fight back against the retrenchment of the federal government. So that is what drives me. And the question that I pose to all of you on this call is what drives you? What makes you angry? Um, and what is your passion? You're, and everyone has passion. You just have to find it and develop it. And um, and uh, and uh, make it a calling. Thank you. Um, I'm sitting here reflecting on my own undergraduate years from many moons ago, and thinking about what do you do exactly? Like, what do you know what you want to do after graduation? Like, how do you prepare for a career, particularly in public in public service, yet still stay open to opportunities that may come along? long that you may not have considered? You know, so um, 
public service, unfortunately, has gotten a dirty name. Um, and there are times when there are kids, and I shouldn't say kids, young people, graduates, sometimes you, there's not a sense of, you don't get a sense of what you want to do upon graduation. And that's understandable. Sometimes it takes a while for you to, to discover a passion, um, a, a calling, if you will. Um, sometimes it, um, it involves uh, facing adversity. Uh, sometimes it, it involves being knocked down. Um, sometimes it's an experience in your life. Public service is really a calling. Um, and public service is the ability to give back to others uh, that which you have been given. And public service is about gratitude and sacrifice um, and, a, and, a, and a calling that is larger than yourself. And it's also about improving the lives of, of individuals who are struggling right now. So, you know, when you're interested in public service, when you see um, immigrants at the border when, who are separated, um, when children are separated by the, with their parents, when children are removed from the arms of their mothers, and you, are, you get upset by that, that's public service. You get, you, public service is uh, when you see so many people who are struggling under the weight of poverty, um, standing on a food pantry line and you look at them and, and that bothers you. That's the calling of public service. Public service is um, uh, when there's, uh, when you see issues in your community that are not being addressed and then you go to other communities and you see that uh, they're being addressed in that community. That's public service. Public service is basically serving others. Um, and public service is responding to a call. Um, and public service is probably, I would think, uh, the greatest calling and one of the greatest careers. Um, and public service right now is crying out for more young people like you. Public service is those individuals who are marching right now in response to a systematic racism. Um, public services are those individuals who want to see change in the criminal justice system and how we, and also how we police, um, how we engage in policing. That's public service. So it's the young people marching with their feet, petitioning their government. Uh, that's public service. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm sure students need to hear that. And I'm sure they're also curious. I know you've done it all, but what leadership positions did you have in college and how did this affect your decision for further leadership? So I didn't hold any positions in college. Um, wow. I really, I wasn't even involved in government in college. Um, you see, because I had to work to mm. help my mom. Mm. Um, and so it was struggling going to school and working and caring for my siblings. I, I didn't have much time. And there's a lot of students out there who have to do the same thing that I do, who come from humble beginnings, uh, but who recognize that education really is the key to success and the key to independence and the key to overcome a, a number of isms. And so you struggle each and every day, but um, what that taught me is um, that I've got to continue this course and get my degree and go beyond so that I can help other students and I can help and provide resources and create resources and programs and initiatives so that other children, other students don't have to struggle like I did. Um, and there is a significant number of programs um, that have been created so that um, other students don't have to, again, engage in the same um, type of a rigor and sacrifice. Oh, thank you. So going off of that, can you just share a time when you faced adversity, how you handled the situation and what did you learn from it? So, you know, I faced adversity quite a bit. I mean, there was a time when I ran for this office and the office before that and the office before that, where people question you. They question your ability, your credentials, uh, they question you as a woman and, and as an African-American woman. Um, and so they have their doubts. And each and every time individuals question my ability, I meet the challenge. In fact, um, in, in most cases, I go above and beyond the challenge. Um, and I don't listen to all of that noise, all that ambient noise. What I listen to is my heart. And... What I listen to is uh, the senior citizen across the street uh, who lives in public housing who says, you go girl, or the woman uh, who, who, um, 
who says, I, I, I need your help, Tish, because um, I'm facing deportation. Um, or um, the family next door to me who's LGBT, um, who says that they've been denied health care um, because um, um, they're gay, um, because of who they love. Um, so it's, it's people like that who I listen to. Um, and it's not um, those people who underestimate me um, because each and every time I overperform and then I just say, there it is. I love that. Love it. That's, that's great. Thank you. Wow. Uh, um, how do you cope with the challenges of leadership? You know, making hard or unpopular decisions, you know, speaking truth to power, holding yourself and others accountable as public servants. I'm a woman of faith. I believe deeply in a higher power. And so oftentimes I lean upon my faith. And most elected officials really don't talk about their relationship um, with their God and, um, and, and how faith um, basically guides them. I belong to a church which preaches social justice each and every Sunday. I went to a school which talked about using the law, the law as a means for um, social justice. Um, I've been fed on um, uh, this, um, uh, fed an encyclopedia of um, ways and means to affect social justice. And so I follow that model. And so um, when, you see, when I saw someone like um, Barbara Jordan, um, who was a congresswoman from Texas, um, who uh, sat on the judiciary um, at the, um, the, uh, um, the, ju the judiciary in the um, impeachment hearings for Richard Nixon. And she said, you know, I will not sit idly by and allow anyone to subvert the constitution. And I was just moved by her booming voice and her presence as the only woman of color on that committee. When I see and read stories about Shirley Chisholm, um, who said, if they don't invite you, you know, uh, you know, to the table, bring your own folding chair. You know, it's individuals like that who inspire me um, to speak truth to power, um, to, to raise your voice and to have a commanding voice and to think outside the box and to challenge individuals um, and to recognize that no one, no one, no matter their status and, and or station in life is above the law and that you have a responsibility because much has been given to you to ensure uh, that the constitution applies to all of, to everyone and that everyone, everyone uh, matters in this country and in this world and that you need to stand up for them, particularly vulnerable and marginalized populations. And those unfortunately uh, who um, carry the burden of poverty on their shoulders, stand up for them, fight for them, and continue to raise your voice to them, for them. And that's what I do. Great, wonderful response, thank you. I know that there are many challenges facing women in leadership positions. How have you learned to navigate these? Well, you know, um, you know, people often talk to me about sexism and racism. And to be honest with you, um, you know, when you, you know it when you see it. Um, but I tend to not allow it to get in my way. I tend to not allow obstacles to get in my way. I usually find a way around it, uh, on top of it, under it, or ignore it, or move it out of the way. Um, and so most of the time, in my experience, I've usually moved them out of the way. I'm, I've, um, um, again, used my skills, use my ability to communicate and use the law um, and the recognition of the law um, to move them out of the way. And there have been obstacles. There's obstacles right now that we all face. You know, this administration wanted to put a census question on uh, a citizenship question on the census. And we went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court um, to strike that down. They wanted to discount um, in the census uh, data from immigrants. Uh, because they wanted to change the apportionment base. We went to court and we won that case. They wanted to treat women like second-class citizens and say that we were not entitled to reproductive rights uh, during uh, COVID-19. 
And I joined and led with other Democratic attorney generals in state after state after state in filing briefs to knock down any restrictions to reproductive rights. They wanted to deny reproductive, they wanted to deny health care to members of the LGBTQ community. Um, they want, basically wanted to discriminate against them. We knocked that down. Um, they wanted to attack and they continue to attack the Republicans, the Affordable Care Act. They want to chip away at the Affordable Care Act um, and deny those with pre existing conditions. And we continue to defend the Affordable Care Act. And they, and they want to chip away and take away um, uh, students who, from being on their parents' uh, health insurance, again, part of the Affordable Care Act. And we, again, uh, continue to challenge, continue to defend that. Um, uh, they want to, again, there's certain um, uh, uh, scholarship um, uh, um, uh, for profit. Uh, organizations that want to basically enroll individuals in these high priced student loans and we challenge um, uh, those institutions as well. The list goes on and on of adversities and challenges that we face e each and every day. But we keep um, moving along because there's a fire in my belly and in the belly of those who I work with, um, uh, a fire for change and for righteousness and this belief that we should stand up to an administration which continues to disregard and disrespect the rights of countless number of Americans. And we will not be denied. And so we use the law both as a sword and as a shield. And we're gonna to continue to do that for the next 48 days. Uh, we're gonna just take a pause for it. Oh, I'm sorry, Dami, I didn't mean to cut you off. We're just gonna say, we're gonna take a pause now to take another poll. So as we've been talking a lot about leadership, you know, we wanna take another quick poll um, and then continue our conversation. But what is the most important? What is the most important quality in a leader? And for this one, we want to hear from everyone who's in attendance, both including um, uh, including our students. Um, and we'd like to give sort of uh, the AG an, an opportunity to sort of react to the different results. So please, everyone who's in attendance, if you could just uh, uh, please select a vote, and then we'll report back. That's interesting. Um, empathy. Empathy. Yeah, that's empathy. It follows shortly right um, behind it with integrity and vision, ability to communicate. So just seeing those qualities um, there, you know, um, you know, again, we can segue back to our conversation, but now you kind of have a sense of um, how our audience is thinking about what are the, the essential elements of leadership. I think, um, you know, we are witnessing uh, a government which unfortunately is not uh, empathetic. And I guess that is why that is leading um, that poll. But was also, but what, is in, what is important to me is integrity. Um, that is really critically important. And at a time when you are seeing a number of elected officials unfortunately not exhibit integrity, that too is a major factor as well. Um, but empathy is important, but integrity is I think more important and making sure that you answer to the call and making sure that you serve others as opposed to serving yourself. That's what's really critically important. Thank you. And I love what you said earlier about, you know, fire for change, fire in the belly and not letting the fire down, die down. That's great. Yeah. And um, why, would, why do you think it is important to have more women in leadership positions, uh, <laughs> specifically for political office? You know, um, we don't have enough women in Congress. We don't have enough women in the assembly. We don't have enough women in the Senate. Um, we don't have enough women in um, municipal office. Um, I am uh, the, the second um, uh, African-American um, attorney general in this nation. The first is our vice presidential nominee, uh, Kamala Harris. Um, she was the first, I'm the second. Um, and we, we sort of govern differently from men. Um, and we are, you know, we tend to be problem solvers. And I, I don't know, um, I think, you know, because we have to, we, we tend to be leaders in our household. Uh, we tend to manage budgets. We tend to go to work, care for the children and to go to school and then respond to the needs of um, our partner. Uh, we do it all. We're just, um, just, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we're just incredible, incredible human beings. 
and therefore we just need more um uh, more women in, in um, public life they say if you want to get something done give it to a woman um, and i agree with that and yes. there's nothing nothing more dangerous than a woman with a made-up mind so watch out love it you and alfredo is shaking <laughs> yes i get it i know when to shut up and listen uh, <laughs> so um how do you lead in turbulent times like today with everything that's going on how do you stay motivated and positive um i i stay um grounded so you know i before we started this session i went for a walk and i'm saying hello to my neighbors i you know went and got some ice cream just stay humble just humble i took out the garbage um i cleaned up uh, um you know part of my house you just remain humble um recognize that you're here to, you're in this position you've been blessed with this position and you're really here to serve others and understand and recognize that there are so many needs right now in our country so many needs in new york um, we need more individuals in, in public, in politics, in public service, in government. We need so many more individuals who are committed to change. And right now, I am just, um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm motivated uh, by the young people who are marching um, in the city, in Albany, in Rochester, who are demanding change. Because we know that at every movement, um, that has ever um, resulted in change didn't be didn't um, it was not started by politicians. Um, most change is not as a result of politicians. Most of the change is as a result of young people from uh, the you know the suffrage movement movement um, to civil rights to anti-war movements uh, to electing Barack Obama and now to what's happening in our country, a systemic racism. It's young people who are marching, um, who are soliciting and petitioning our government for change. And so I will defend their right to peacefully protest. Um, but um, I'm encouraged um, by the diversity of the group. Um, I'm and I'm encouraged by their demands for change. And um, I am encouraged um, that the next generation of leaders will continue um, to improve and improve upon um, this nation and perfect um, this nation um, and make sure that all voices are at the table and that um, all voices are heard. I'm encouraged. Thank you. Um, thinking about everything you just shared, what are the greatest challenges of being a leader? You know, it's a, it's a challenge right now. You know, we are seeing... Um, a number of pandemics, um, global warming. Tonight, California, Oregon, and, and Washington still burn. Um, greenhouse gases. Um, we are seeing an administration, unfortunately, which has um, turned its back on clean air, clean water, clean energy. Um, we've got um, COVID-19, where Unfortunately, thousands of people have lost their lives because of a lack of leadership. We have gun violence, where I had to attend a funeral of a one-year-old baby who died at a barbecue. And I, and I too often attend funerals of um, young people who die and I've had to hold too many mothers and fathers and family members crying over open, open caskets. And unfortunately, um, um, we've got a we've got um, members of Congress, particularly Republicans, who don't want to address the issue of gun, sensible gun on gun reform, sensible gun laws. Um, uh, we have uh, the killing of uh, innocent and um, black men and people of color in this nation, um, and people demanding change, and it continues to happen. Um, we've got um, this distrust and this divide in our nation, we, we are witnessing, our nation is more divided than it's been since the Civil War. And so um, there's a lot of challenges and pandemics that we are witnessing right now. 
And what we really need to do is heal the divide, heal the breach, provide leadership in this nation, um, but also listen to young people and listen to all of those individuals who are marching and come up and, and, um, and come up with some solutions. Um, but the best way to do it is through communication and through respecting the voices of all individuals and to ensure that all voices are at the table. But it commands leadership and empathy and integrity um, and intelligence and respect for the we one Thank you. We have one final question then before we open it up for Q&A. Did you have a mentor when you became involved in politics and how did that help or hurt you? Um, did I, I, have an, I had a number of mentors um, um, in my life, um, but the mentors are you know, probably family members my mom is a mentor. Um, uh, there's a senator, um, Senator Velman at Montgomery is a mentor. Um, former Assemblywoman Annette Robinson is a mentor. Um, uh, my, my previous boss, Al Van, was a mentor. I had a number of mentors um, who taught me and who allowed me but, um, to focus on social justice. But one of my major mentors is Barbara Jordan. Um, Shirley Chisholm and Thurgood Marshall. Um, those are the individuals I look to for inspiration. Um, and, uh, and those are the, um, and, and uh, a, a, when I was in um, law school, I read a book called Simple Justice, um, which talked about the civil rights movement when I was in college, actually. I read the book Simple Justice and it was one of the reasons why I decided to go to Howard University, which was a laboratory for the civil rights movement. And I just wanted to walk the halls of an, uh, of an institution which basically dismantled um, legal segregation in this country. And I, I wanted, that's where I wanted to learn um, how to affect change and how to challenge the status quo. Um, and that's um, what I uh, hope to do in my position as the Attorney General of the great state of New York. Thank you so much for sharing so much about yourself. Um, I know I'm honored just from hearing of you sharing those responses and the fact that we could all hold space here together and, and learn so much from you. So thank you. Thank At you. this time, we're going to open up the questions from the audience. I just want to remind everyone um, that the Attorney General can't answer questions about matters before her office or in litigation. Uh, so please help us honor the spirit and intention of this program and try to keep those questions to topics related to leadership career preparation, internships, and public service. Thank you. So I think I'm turning it over now to um, my producers in the background who will be taking questions and, 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 give, and providing them to you, starting probably with Mary Hunt. Yes, yeah, so our first question uh, comes to us from a young woman, and she says, it's an honor to have you here tonight, Attorney General James. Do you deal with imposter syndrome, and what tips do you have for a minority woman being the only one in the workplace? Ooh, interesting. Um, so I think in the workplace, you've got to find um, um, alliance, uh, allies. Um, it's important that you find allies. And there is um, a number of allies that I've reached out to throughout my career, um, who I've joined with, who have a sense of social justice, who may not, who are individuals who are not of color. But they recognize that, um, uh, that there is a need for change and they respected who I was. And, um, and, and though they could not um, uh, completely understand um, uh, what I experienced, um, they were empathetic um, and um, they joined with me um, in uh, being an ally and um, fighting for some change. Um, and I think um, you will find some allies at your workplace. Um, you just have to sit back and observe their behavior and, and um, listen to a lot of their comments and you'll pick up on um, uh, who you can associate yourself with.
Mary, are you seeing the second question? If so, we can't hear you. Is she on mute? No, no she is. she's on mute. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can. All right, great. The next question asks, what is the most interesting aspect of your job as attorney general? Ooh, um, interesting aspect of my, each and every day is, a, is, is different. Each and every day brings um, uh, different complexities um, and different issues. But what I like most about my office is the ability to initiate affirmative litigation. Um, for the most part, we are responding to the retrenchment of the federal government, but every now and then we bring affirmative litigation. For instance, um, we brought an action against a landlord um, in Buffalo for um, violations of the housing code. And as a result of that, the individual had to sell most of his portfolio. Um, and we worked with a preservation company um, to uh, basically uh, address all of the violations. Uh, correct the conditions and return them to the tenants. It's issues like that that I enjoy. It's initiation, it's um, affirmative litigation like that that I particularly enjoy. Uh, we are also investigating housing discrimination on Long Island based upon a expose by Newsday. Um, um, I enjoy that. We are also, um, uh, there was a, a, a most recently um, a breach, um, a privacy breach related to Dunkin' Donuts um, credit cards. Um, that was interesting, getting relief for individuals who enjoyed Dunkin' Donuts. So it's it, issues like that, that um, consumer issues like that, um, that I'm fascinated with, and again, engaging in affirmative litigation, um, but particularly in the area of housing and consumer rights. you wish you had known about your position before you started? What did you, what did you say? What was the question? One more time? Mary, could you repeat that? Yeah. That's cutting off in the beginning, Mary, when you speak. Sure. What do you wish you had known before about your position before you started? Um, well, I knew about the position because I previously worked in the attorney general's office as head of the Brooklyn office. Um, so um, um, I knew a lot about the office. Um, um, let's see. Um, oh, I did not know the office moved. <laughs> the office at one time was at uh, 120 Broadway and then they moved to uh, uh, Liberty Street, this fancy new building. And I was just so used to working um, at 120 uh, Broadway. Um, um, but they sort of upgraded um, and they um, moved to really new fancy offices um, and they're really pristine. Um, and um, uh, um, it was a change for me. Uh, what is some advice you can give for someone who wants to enter public service, but is unsure of the specific avenue they want to take? Do some externships, some internships, um, do some exploration during your time in college. Um, my office has a number of internships available. Um, and so if you want to experience public service, uh, you should apply for a, um, an internship and or externship with my office. Between us. I have another question, Attorney General James. Did you ever face burnout while even or while in either undergraduate or law school? And how did you cope with it? No, um, I've never I never I didn't face burnout. Um, there's times when um, fatigue sets in. Um, I guess I, I faced um, burnout when I was a public defender um, because you have to represent um, so many individuals um, and um, uh, uh, you, your caseload uh, oftentimes is very, very challenging. Um, so there was a time when I recognized that um, I no longer had the fire in my belly um, and I wanted to um, 
do something on a larger scale to affect the lives of those individuals that I was representing. And that's why I decided to work in the state legislature. Um, and I know a number of you are, work, um, are volunteering and are working in the state legislature. So I worked in the state legislature for 10 years um, and I traveled back and forth from, to Albany from Brooklyn and I did it on a weekly basis. Um, and it was there that I um, uh, gathered a, a greater love for public service um, and it just reaffirmed um, um, uh, my, um, uh, reaffirmed my uh, belief or interest in running for public office. All. Thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, and she says, I often find myself stretched too thin because I am passionate about more than one thing. Mm -hmm. What is your advice to students who would like to focus their goals without thinking too narrowly? Um, so yeah, I have a number of um, passions. Um, social justice obviously is my main passion, but I do have other passions as well. And oftentimes um, I, I stretch myself too thin. I like to teach. I teach a class as, um, uh, for, at Empire College. They are apprentices at Local 3. Um, I also like to sing. Um, um, and I also like Broadway. Um, so, there's, so I can't do it all. Um, um, and so I focus on that which pays the bills <laughs> and that which is my first love. And my first love, obviously, is social justice. But you, I think, I guess, and also, you know, you got to find time for yourself. You have to have downtime. You need to oftentimes um, step away um, from um, heady matters um, and just collect your thoughts, exhale, breathe, um, and take some time for yourself. That is so critically important. Um, so for all of those who enjoy yoga, if... Um, you should engage in that. For me, it's um, about taking time um, and um, again, going, praying um, and enjoying church service. Oh, go ahead. Can you, have you had a moment of truth where you knew you were exactly where you should be in your career? Um, so it's interesting because, you know, there people had their doubts about whether or not um, I was, whether or not I should run for attorney general. Um, there were a number of individuals, including um, every major newspaper, um, except for one, um, did not endorse me um, in my race for attorney general. Um, and um, uh, now, um, as they look back, um, they say, um, given as, as such a time as these, um, you were best suited for this position because of all that is happening in this nation, um, because of your activism, because of your empathy, because of who you are as a black woman, um, um, uh, because of the division that we are experiencing, because of the systemic racism, um, because of uh, questions with regards to policing, um, you, were, you were best suited to serve as the attorney general. Um, and so all of those individuals who doubted me then um, have now um, reached out and said, uh, um, uh, given this time um, and, and, and such a time as this, um, it was suited for Letitia James, um, who was basically the fighter um, uh, and uh, um, someone who um, has a moral compass and um, someone who has committed her career to to uh, social justice. Thank you for your public service uh, and thank you for your solid example of exemplary leadership, especially for other women. What can you say to our students who are registered to vote um, and to encourage them to make sure they exercise their right to vote? So, uh, so as you know, um, voter suppression is an issue that we all should be focused on right now. And as you know, most recently, I filed a lawsuit against the Postal Service to um, ensure that the Postal Service does not engage in voter suppression. 
Um, and so uh, we have individuals and we, uh, the governor of the state of New York um, and the state legislature um, has um, passed into law early voting. And so there really is no excuse. We also now have absentee ballots um, because of COVID-19, the governor signed an executive order. Um, uh, so individuals um, really should either um, uh, in, uh, one vote early or two, um, fill out an absentee ballot or three, um, vote in person. Um, because no matter what they throw at us, um, we need to vote. And we need to vote in record numbers. And we need to um, stand in line on election day in quiet defiance of all that they have attempted to do um, to suppress that basic franchise. Um, because countless number of individuals have sacrificed and have bled and have died for the right to vote. And in honor of the late um, Congress member John Lewis, we have a responsibility and a duty to vote. Um, and so no matter what the excuse is, um, put it aside and just exercise that basic franchise um, because democracy is on the ballot. Um, and there's so much on the ballot at this point in time. Our basic and fundamental rights are on the ballot. Um, and so I don't know about you, um, uh, I'm going to bring at least 20 to 30 friends with me to, to vote um, because um, as far as I'm concerned, um, this administration represents an existential threat to everything that I believe in. Um, and uh, I wanna change. And so vote, vote because um, everything matters. Our next question um, is, have you, have you, or how have you, excuse me, ever, have you ever been denied access to any educational experience or a job because of your gender or race? If so, how did you deal with it? And what advice do you offer to those who have been discriminated against? You know, well, obviously if you've been discriminated against because of your gender, because of your race, because of your sexual orientation, obviously we've got laws on the books that um, prohibit that and um, provide you provide individuals with recourse. And I would urge you to reach out to the Human Rights um, Commission and or reach out to my office. Um, two, um, um, I don't know whether or not I, I, I was denied this position because of my race or my gender. Um, it was probably because of my politics. I was denied um, a position in the district attorney's office in Manhattan. Partly, I guess it's because of my activism, um, but it was probably the best decision in my life um, because I was rejected by the prosecutor, but I was picked up by the public defender. And the public defender's um, office basically throws you into the courtroom on day one. Um, and uh, um, you've got to sink or swim. Uh, and it teaches you how to stand on your feet um, and how to articulate a defense and to defend the Constitution. Um, so it was really a blessing in the disguise. I didn't realize it then, but I realize it now. Um, and so I thank them for rejecting me. Um, but I, um, uh, the Legal Aid Society was probably the best experience in my life um, and has taught me how to be one of the greatest litigators um, um, now and uh, in the state. You may have just asked or answered this question, but we will uh, ask it in case you have another case in mind. Um, one of our audience members asks, if there is one specific case you've been a part of that sticks out as the most significant to you or had a great impact on you, whether personally or professionally. So I, so when I was a public defender, the last case that I, um, uh, where I represented an individual um, was the burning bed case where a woman was accused of setting um, her husband or boyfriend's um, bed on fire. Um, and, um, um, you know, she was a victim of domestic violence. Um, and that case took a lot out of me. We won that case. She was found not guilty. Um, but uh, that was why previous, my last case, um, and I recently saw that young lady on a train um, and she came up to me and she congratulated me because it turned her life around. Um, and then probably the most significant case that I've worked on as the attorney general thus far is the census case, uh, where we, again, challenge the citizenship question. Um, and uh, um, uh, we um, basically um, stood up for the rights of immigrants and we stood up for the constitution. 
um, because the Constitution speaks to the enumeration of all individuals, regardless of their status, immigration status. And this administration, federal administration, has demonstrated uh, racial animus towards immigrants. And we continue to challenge this administration each and every time. Um, and it, it has had a chilling effect on the, um, uh, the response rate of the census. And so I urge everyone, in addition to voting, um, please fill out the census. Um, it's 10 questions and it will take 10 minutes of your life because the census is tied to reapportionment. And in New York, we once had 45 congressional representatives. We now only have 27. And there's a possibility, um, given the low uh, response rate from the census, um, that we could lose maybe one or two congressional seats. And so we need everyone to fill out the census. The census is also tied to resources, um, resources uh, related to education, transportation, and roads and bridges, and resources that we so desperately need for everyone. Um, and our response rate right now is around 60%, and we obviously need to raise it, and we only have two more weeks. And so I urge everyone to fill out the census because it's so critically important um, to, to, the, to um, our government and to democracy um, and to our representation of, in Washington, D.C. And we can ill afford to lose any more representatives in Congress. So if you haven't filled out the census after this, se this session, go fill out the census and do it now and send it in. Mary, if you're asking the question, we can't hear you. I think Mary may be having some, um, she's having some audio problems. Oh. Um, and so um, I think even where we are right now with time, we may not be able to take um, another question. Did you, um, why don't we just move on to the next part, uh, Dami, of sort of providing some closing thoughts with whatever's remaining. Yeah, um, I just want to say thanks to every student, anyone who asked the question and thank you attorney general for just you know being thoughtful and really just going in depth on your answers much appreciated but um just any last words advice to the students on the call just anyone something just you were yeah, told? just continue to raise your voice continue to lead continue to march with your feet um and, and uh, um continue to um push for a more perfect union um and stand up for others, even if you stand alone. So um, I thank you. I do know that we're gonna get past this pandemic. And when we get to the other side of the mountain, we will all be together. Um, and, when we were all, and when we are all together, all of us will stand together um, to demand um, uh, that uh, the rights of all um, individuals are respected. Um, and we will um, again join hands um, in recognizing um, that no one is above the law um, and uh, uh, that the law is both the law is both a sword and a shield um, and that um, education really is the key um, to our independence and to our freedom and so I thank you all I look forward to seeing you all on the campus of University of Albany um, and thank you for being so awesome well Mary did pass one more question to me before we, we sign you off, but I think you touched on it even earlier. Um, if a student is interested in an internship opportunity, how do they contact? Um, so they could reach out to our office and um, um, I believe you, you should have our contact information, um, but we do have internship positions available. Um, some of them are paid. I decided to pay our interns, um, but please apply um and please uh i would hope to see you in our office or at an externship um in the office of attorney general uh, we have health care we've got internet we've got antitrust we've got consumer we've got criminal justice uh we've got SIPU, we've got medicaid fraud we've got consumer rights um wide range of issues um and so i need you and i need you now 
Not thank at all. you so much. Um, I just want to take this time uh, to thank you um, on behalf of everyone here at the University of Albany, um, Attorney General Letitia James, for being our first guest for Leading Questions. We do hope that you'll come back to UAlbany often and soon. And it's been a pleasure uh, just hearing about um, your story and just uh, sharing parts of you with us today. Um, and, and again, we always wish you the best. And I wanna just take an opportunity to thank our Leading Question Campus partners, um, the Center for Leadership and Service, uh, the Center for Women in Government and Civil Society, the Division of Student Affairs, the Office of Government and Community Relations, the School of Criminal Justice, the Student Association, and of course, this couldn't have been possible without the ITS field support. And I also want to thank um, my co-host, uh, Dami. Uh, I've worked with Dami uh, now for the past three months. I feel like uh, we make a great team, Dami, and the work that we do together. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And we'll be back in uh, next month with another edition of Leading Questions. And that wraps it up. So good night, everyone. Thank you for thank joining. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye, Dami. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.